evening, everyone. Oh, I think I can be heard in the far corners of the room. Like every room on campus, students are in the back, so that's okay. Uh, our, our speaker tonight will reach you wherever you're sitting. Welcome, I'm Bill Brown with Brookings Mountain West. As this is our first lecture of the spring semester, I'll just say to those of you who haven't joined us before, this is a partnership between UNLV and the Brookings Institution and we bring our colleagues out from Brookings during the academic year to teach classes, collaborate with faculty, get out into the community when their research interests mesh, uh, and also to give public lectures. And we're thrilled to have our colleague Ron Haskins back tonight. Uh, for those of you, again, in person, thanks for coming. Those of you watching us on our YouTube channel, we appreciate that. If you're tuning in on public radio in a few days, thanks for watching as well. And as you can see, we're recording, so thanks to our Greenspun College colleagues for making all that possible. We're gonna to talk tonight about public policy and figuring out how and if it works, uh, how it can be measured, and something that a lot of public officials don't spend as much time on uh, as we might like of actually evaluating public policy. Let me tell you a little bit about our speaker. Ron is a senior fellow at Brookings and holds the Cabot Family Chair in Economic Studies, where he co-directs the Center on Children and Families. He's also a senior consultant at the Annie E. Casey Foundation, and he spent 14 years on the staff of the House Ways and Means Committee and was then appointed senior advisor to President Bush for welfare policy. So he has a long and distinguished career in economics and social policy, and we're fortunate to have him tonight. He's been with us from the launch of Brookings Mountain West. He's spoken to us on topics like the federal deficit and budgets and opportunities, mobility, and tonight we're gonna, as, we, as evidenced by the title, delve into some social problems. So let me bring Ron up and get us started. The applause at the beginning is very good, because uh, at the end, it's a little shaky. Um, I wish I were talking about the, about the budget deficit tonight. I'm not entirely serious about that, but we just made one of the worst budgets in our lifetime, uh, if it actually passes. I'm, I'm just I'm hoping it's not going to pass, although I don't want to close the government and all that, but we already have a huge budget problem. And now we're going to make it much worse. We're going to redo the baseline, which means the point at which we start. So it's, it's a very, very uh, bad thing. And I'm very worried about it. But I can't talk about that because I'm going to talk about something else even more important. And they're actually related. Uh, because now it looks like the members of Congress are not going to bargain away the budget problems. We're going to have to solve problems, social problems, to stop spending so much money because we have lower uh, lower level of social problems. A lot of people doubt that that can be done, but I'm not one of them. So let me start with an overview of, and this is essential to start here at this place. Our social programs do not work. There are a lot of people, especially program operators and uh, congressmen, who will make all kinds of outrageous claims about how they solve this and that problem. They can teach kids to read, and they'll grow up to be great scholars. They'll solve the problem of failure in math and reading in school. Uh, we can solve the juvenile delinquency. We can end teen pregnancy. We can do all kinds of great things. It's just not true. There are isolated instances in which we have been able to have major impacts on social problems, but they are rare. And in most places where we implement the programs, uh, they don't work. So one of the real, I have a great friend uh, who's a very central figure in this field named Gordon Berlin who runs a manpower demonstration, MDRC, uh, in New York. And he says that replication, in other words, we get something that works, we try it somewhere else, will it work? And the answer is almost always no. So re it's called replication and it doesn't work. It's the Achilles heel, according to Gordon, of social science, and I've written that s uh, several times myself. So it's not just a problem of finding a, a program that will solve a problem in one setting on, at one time. We have enough trouble with that. 
uh, but we also have a problem replicating it. I've given some really good examples up here from people who are very prominent in this field. Many of you probably know about Peter Erzag, who is the head of Office of Management and Budget. I'll come back to that a few times, so let me just say the Office of Management and Budget is, I think, clearly the most important administrative organization in the federal government. They're, you could think of them as the quarterback uh, of administration policy and implementation of policy in the federal government. And the director of OMB is uh, just a little below the president in terms of power. And in some cases, I think the president of OMB, uh, the head of OMB, is even more important than the president because they help the president make the most important decisions, especially, above all, decisions on the budget. So the head of OMB is extremely important. Peter Orzag actually said in an article in The Atlantic, and I heard him say it uh, in, on several of his speeches, uh, that we know about the impact of less than 1% of federal spending. Now this is not positive impact, this is any impact. We just don't know. Because in many cases we haven't evaluated the programs, but we do not know what the impact of these programs are. So the ones we evaluate tend to fail, but in the majority we do not evaluate. Jim Manzi, who's one of the most important figures in the field, uh, said in a book, Uncontrolled, in 2012, that 89, 80 to 90% of social, medical, and business programs. So this is not just social. It, uh, many programs in business, and we have, it's shocking how many programs we now have in business, how many random assignment studies we have in business. We have like 10,000 a year. Uh, so there are many, many studies, and about 90% of those fail, and a disproportionate number fail in medical research as well, which is a good thing. We want to know the ones in medical research that don't work because it might kill you uh, if, we find, if we think something works and we start uh, spreading it widely. So, uh, and then my colleague John Barron and my colleague Isabel Sawhill, who's at Brookings, uh, did, a, um, did research in 20, it was published in 2010, and they looked at 10 very famous uh, federal studies uh, such as Upward Bound, 21st Century Learning Centers, and Head Start. And they all failed, nine of the 10 failed or produced very modest results. The only really successful program was early Head Start, and the, the effects of that program failed in the long run. So I think there's just, it's very hard to dispute the idea that most of our programs don't work. This does not discourage me. I'm glad we found out because it's really important to know that our programs are not working. We need to figure out, and we need to start at the top with members of Congress, and the researchers need to know it, and very importantly, program operators, teachers, principals, uh, people who run programs in the field, people who are in charge of teen pregnancy prevention programs, and many other kinds of programs. They need to know it, and they need to know that they should be highly motivated to make these programs work. So that, that's a really important piece of information. And you need to keep that in mind for the rest of my presentation, because this is our baseline. Programs don't work. And some of you may want to challenge us, and we'll have plenty of time in the discussion period to do it. So write this in your notes and challenge me on it if you want to. So now along comes Obama, and Obama knew it. Obama knew the programs didn't work. He was being advised by Orzag, that's one reason, but I've already talked about how important OMB is as a quarterback, and OMB knew it, and OMB has known it for years. And uh, OMB advised Obama and his senior, uh, his senior advisors that it would be great if their administration could make it a major goal to change this course and to figure out ways, it wasn't so much specific programs, although that was important, but methods, approaches, that would work to develop programs so that we could improve our social programs over time. And so they set out to do that, um, and they were, I would say, on a 10-point scale, you know, seven would be a reasonable measure. But if you think of it from a historical perspective, that nobody else gave it the serious effort that Obama did, it's, it's even higher than that. So this is, a, I think this is a great effort. I wrote a book about it. Uh, and I tried to detail what they actually did, and there's not much in there about success because uh, I only it hadn't enough time had not yet passed to assess that. Now we can make some assessments, and I'm going to do some of that here in just a minute with you. The reason that they were so successful, again, Office of Management and Budget played a huge role. They were the quarterback of this, like so many other things. 
They had total support from ORSAG, who gave them financial support and gave them the time, senior executives at OMB, to negotiate. I'll talk more about that uh, later. They met individually with agency heads. In order to implement this, their, their approach, they needed organizations like Health and Human Services, Department of Labor, uh, Department of Agriculture. They needed them to be all in. Because if they weren't, these programs would fail again. You, you, uh, I'm not going to talk much about this, but I just want to tell you right now that not only the model program and the evidence that the program itself and the mechanics of the program work, but the aggressiveness and wisdom of the way it's implemented is crucial as well. And we don't get good implementation in, in many cases, not all, but in many cases, unless the agency is able to give good advice to make sure that the uh, programs that are being the the program managers that are doing the implementing at the local level uh, are are fully supported by federal <coughs> agencies. You know, I can remember years ago when uh, Tip O'Neill, who was a Speaker of the House, many of you may remember him, a very colorful Speaker of the House from Massachusetts, and he used to say, he said a lot. He was known for saying that all politics is local. Uh, I always wondered, what it doesn't seem true to me, but I'll tell you this. All program implementation is local. It's what happens at the local level that ultimately counts. So these programs have to produce impacts at the local level. So it's those local program managers, the equivalent of the teacher and the principal in our public schools, they have to be good. They have to be very good. I remember, I, I, I have a master's degree in education. I can remember one of the sayings that I always remembered was that there's no such thing as teacher-proof curriculum. And I think that's true. You've got to have wise implementation, and the same is true here with all of these programs. So lots of meetings with the head of the individual agencies, and again, it was primarily people from OMB, and they were very good at it. They were very good at it. They weren't arrogant. A lot of people from senior administrators in Washington are pretty arrogant. I know it's amazed to hear that. I'm sure you are. Uh, but uh, it's true. But the people who were selected to do these jobs were not arrogant. They worked closely, hand in glove. They listened to people. They did a very good job, and they rallied people to be behind them. So the administration had a lot of support from both the career people who'd been who, there a long time. I'll just stop here a little bit. Many of you probably already know this. But our agency should have run by career people who've been there, in many cases, for 20, 30, 40 years. They're very good. They're extremely competent. Uh, most of them, not all of them, but most of them. And by political people. They have senior political people who are appointed by the president or the administration. And they are even more important. They really have control. Although there's an interesting uh, you know, tussle between the career people uh, and the administ administrative people. But uh, in this case, the Obama administration worked with both and, and did a lot to help them work together or in some cases, you know, more than encourage them, more or less force them. Also, they were extremely good in getting legislation passed. I'll show you in just a minute. There were six crucial pieces of legislation that were passed, and all of them were passed by the United States Congress. And the, the, the congressional strategy uh, employed by the administration and the relentless uh, focus on convincing the members how important this was, make sure these provisions stay in the bill, vote for the bill and make sure that the money's appointed and so forth was really, it was a thing of beauty. I spent 15 years uh, in, uh, one year in the Senate and 14 years in the House, and then I was in the White House for a year, so I had a lot of experience actively involved in legislation. And it, working in the United States Congress and trying to pass legislation is an amazing experience. I think it's the most challenging experience in my life. And when you actually pass a bill, you know, you, you immediately go out and do all kinds of things you shouldn't do, you know, as an adult. And Las Vegas would be a great place to do those things. Uh, so it, because you feel such a sense of triumph when you actually manage to pass, because you lose at least 10 bills uh, before you actually f finally pass one. And I worked on several pieces of legislation. It took us 10 years, literally, to pass the legislation. We kept bringing it back, bringing it back, patiently making changes and so forth. And so Obama, was able to do that. He didn't have 10 years, but he was still able to pass the legislation. Most of these, most of this legislation uh, was passed in 2009 and 2010, 
And that's very important. I just got through telling how brilliant their strategy was and so forth. But they did have one advantage that frequently happens in Congress. Their bills were not very big. They weren't huge uh, pieces of legislation, didn't spend a lot of money. Uh, and as a result of that, you could hide the bills in big pieces of legislation. And I will bet you that there are at least half the members, I would say it's even more than that, that voted for the bills that contained these provisions that passed the, the, these programs that I'm focusing on tonight, didn't know that they were even in the bill. That happens all the time. Because the members, you know, you got a thousand page bill, who can read it? So the staff are supposed to read it, members are supposed to know, but of course it's virtually impossible. So that was a very important thing and it played a role in being able to pass this legislation. Now, these are the programs, I'm not gonna talk much about them because I don't have time in an hour to cover this and I'm gonna go into great detail in one of these in a minute. Teen pregnancy prevention. Home visiting, very important program. And let me tell you something. This year, starting this year, this year, 1918, uh, 1918, uh, 2018 and 2019, we're going to get the same kind of thing that we're get with home visiting that we're getting now with teen pregnancy. So prepare yourself for this to, story to repeat itself. Maybe, I, Bill, I'm, I'll come back in a year or two and repeat this with home visiting, and I hope it's totally different than the story I'm going to tell you tonight. Uh, Invest in Innovation was an innovative education program, very interesting program. Social Innovation Fund was a way to give money directly to local uh, programs that attempted to reach uh, uh, social reform at the local level, and they had to raise three times as much money as they got from the federal government, so it was a way of increasing the amount of money available. Uh, and the Workforce Innovation Fund and Trade Adjustment Assistance were fairly creative ways of creating good programs to train poor kids in how to get better jobs Roughly, I mean, there's more involved in that. Uh, one of the bills especially focused on people who lost their employment because of trade, which is pretty much impossible to tell in many cases. But they didn't last very long, so we can ignore them. And as I said, I'm gonna focus on teen pregnancy prevention. So now I wanna talk about, this is a very important part of the talk because this is what the Obama administration dreamed up. This is the secret sauce of what the administration thought of to be able to pass legislation and make a program successful in the countryside. So the whole area is called evidence-based policy. And if you're going to have evidence-based policy, you have to be able to pick evidence-based programs. Now think of the logic here. You want to start, I told you, we have a huge range of programs and most of them don't work, but some of them do. And some of them work a little bit, they're promising. They might work if you worked on them a little bit more and developed them a little bit more. So you've got to have a method of identifying what these evidence-based programs are. And the administration thought of two things. One of them was that they worked with a, a wonderful research firm called Mathematica. Uh, and they went, this is teen pregnancy prevention here. They reviewed with the administration, with HHS, with the Administration for Children and Families at HHS, they reviewed 10,000, 10,000 studies to find the ones that had the strongest evidence that they actually produced an impact on some behavior related to sex or to actual pregnancy um, or teen births. And they came up with, at that time, they came up with around 20 uh, model programs that were able to do that they're now a, a slightly higher number, you'll see in just a minute when I go over this in more detail. And then the second thing they did was that they allowed grant applicants for funding to build their own case, to do a literature review themselves. And they could build the case about why the program that they were employing was the greatest thing since sliced bread. Uh, that first method of doing it, I think, is going to be what we use in the long run, because we need to start with the programs that work the best and I trust HHS to do it. But we now know after the first round of studies, and I'll show it to you in a few minutes, that the method that we used was uh, somewhat of a failure because they approved too many programs. 30 was too many, 25 was too many. Uh, it should be more like 10 or eight. We need a smaller number of programs that we have better data because if we don't do that and we start with programs that are so-so, they don't work. 
and now we're right back where we started that we're not being successful in finding problems that are, are effective. And we want to start there because we're going to develop them to make them better. That's the goal of this whole approach. Um, and it's the goal of the whole approach that's implemented through something called continuous evaluation. This is controversial because a lot of people, especially program operators, don't think we should spend a lot of money on evaluation. But my view is we have to, we don't have a choice, we have to evaluate these programs continuously. We want them to improve. How do we know they improve if we don't evaluate them? So we not only have to evaluate them, I'd like to stop here and give a 10 minute uh, set of comments about how we know these programs are effective. Uh, but we have, this is one of the strongest uh, facets of this whole approach and of involving social science and public policy analysis is that we have a method by which we can identify programs that fail and programs that are successful. Without that, we could not make progress. That's a crucial foundation of the field, and we have that. We know if a program is working or not because we have very effective methods in identifying programs that work. It's called use of random assignment studies. Maybe someone will ask me about it in the discussion, and I'll make a comment more uh, comment about it. The next thing is, which Congress often did not do at all. They didn't specify exactly the outcomes they wanted. There are all kinds of general language. You're going to you're fix the world. But Obama, in almost every initiative, specified exact outcomes that they want. So in teen pregnancy prevention, they want to reduce uh, sexual you know, foreplay, and they even laid out some things that they wanted to uh, reduce. They want to reduce the actual pregnancy rate, and they'd like to reduce reduce the birth rate. In the home visiting, they want to change this in the mother's behavior. They want to change this in the child's health. They lay these things out in detail. And then they told HHS that they had to evaluate these things. So that meant that they had to teach all these programs to be involved in evaluation, either to do it themselves or work with others. And so that is really a crucial part of this as well. We got continuous evaluation, a foundation of the evidence-based movement going on. Very, very important. And I can tell you, if we measured the number of people in the field who know about uh, evaluation, and if we measured, if, believe it or not, if we measured the number of projects that we know, based on quality, rigorous evaluation, whether they work or not, it has exploded in recent years. And the reason is that we've done exactly what we needed to do and why the continuous evaluation was so important. We've changed the culture. We have changed the culture of understanding whether programs work. Now that doesn't mean every program, but we have so many programs now that understand a lot of programs like ours don't work. Of course, we're different. We're going to work, uh, but we got to evaluate. We need to find out if it works. So that's a really, really important part. And then another thing that was psychologically very important. I encountered this over and over again. That program operators got discouraged when we started forcing them, because we did, we forced them. If they wanted the federal dollars, they have to evaluate, and they have to use rigorous, effective methods. And what's the result? I've told you already, that logically, what the result's going to be. A lot of the programs are going to fail. So you have literally thousands of program operators around the country who thought their program was working, and boy, they had a lot of anecdotal evidence that they could say they're really producing good results in their program, but they didn't know if their programs would work. So now we evaluate them effectively and we found that the programs don't work and they're very discouraged. So we need a way, and the agency, I already told you about how important the agencies are. They have to help the, the, the program operators expect us and tell them it might happen, and if it does, we're going to stick with you. We're not going to cut your money. You're going to have several years of funding to try to improve your program. This is what we expect. So that's the essence to doing it this way. You've got to improve the program. You, and uh, often hear a nifty little saying from, uh, from senior administrators in, in Washington say, you, fa you have to fail to succeed. You fail at first, and then you develop the program, and then you can succeed. So here's a whole approach uh, that the Obama administration developed. You know what? I can't see a clock. What time is it? 6.30. Okay, so I have an hour and a half left, right? Is that right, Bill? Okay. Now I want to use teen pregnancy as an example, uh, and I want to um, 
give you a quick overview of the most important parts of this. So we're in the context, shocking for Washington. You're lucky I'm here because I'll tell you things you never heard before. That there's been a long dispute between the left and the right on teen, on any kind of pregnancy prevention. And it boils down to the right believes that abstinence is the correct way and the left believes that birth control is the correct and most effective way. And this has been a huge, if I may say, ridiculous fight from the very beginning. I was involved in the 1996 welfare reform bill when the federal government passed for the first time a strictly abstinence only edu education bill. We gave the states $50 million a year to develop abstinence only programs and they could not advocate birth control. Well, this is nuts. Birth control works. So does abstinence. So there ought to be ways to combine. And believe it or not, this happens often, that the, the, the field, the programs in the field develop these programs. And they gradually, over a period of years, develop programs that did both, that emphasized both. And in fact, I think I have on here, yeah, the curriculum's on the second bullet there. They develop programs that interested kids and they involve kids in constructive community-based activities like working at food pantries, helping old people, teaching kids to read and write. And the, the successful programs had a lot of activities like that. And the reviews gradually showed over a period of years that this was really an important component. So even though the fight was over birth control or abstinence, the good programs had both. They emphasized both without being negative about anything, and they had other activities in the program. So that's the kind of program we gradually developed over the years. I think we have way more programs like that now than we did in the past. But there's still plenty of fighting, uh, as you'll see in just a minute. But it's, it's just not, we have, we have this in general in our public policies. We do way, way too much fighting because of these ideological views that the other side is wrong when it's just not just not so. I already told you 1996 welfare reform bill actually gave uh, 50 million dollars a year which we had for several years to de develop absence only programs which I think on the whole was a good thing uh, and we did develop some good absence programs and many of them combined abstinence they couldn't actually support uh, birth control but they could include information about it which is that's really the essential thing I think. Uh, and then we got 2009 legislation, and this is where Obama's approach was established and it passed. Uh, and we wound up with a roughly 100 uh, programs around the country that employed the Obama approach, which I'm going to come back to in just a minute. Uh, and then, so now we can see that both programs have their own legislative support. They can, you know, uh, go ye therefore and multiply. Uh, and try to develop effective programs. If they'd been working together, I think they would have been a lot more successful, but this is the way we do it sometimes in the United States. Uh, and so I would say at this point, 2010 to 2015 or so, 16, uh, that we, teen pregnancy prevention, the Obama program was developing quite well. I would say even better than might be expected when it was first enacted. Uh, I just wanted to show you, because you, someone might have talked to you about this or you might see in the paper. This is one of the few social programs in the United States that we have been really successful. Nobody knows why. And we don't know the role that these teen pregnancy prevention programs or the absence only programs played, but it stands to reason that they probably played a role here. But this is, every year since 1991, teen pregnancy prevention rates have declined except for two years. But, get this, we still have among the highest, in fact, the highest teen pregnancy rate of any of the advanced democracies. Uh, Japan's is like one-tenth of ours. Uh, and Europe's are one-fifth, one-fourth, one-third. So there are big differences, and that obviously means that we could reduce it. We had, uh, I think we had uh, uh, 700,000 non-marital births among teenagers last year, and they are expensive. That's the whole thing we're trying to avoid here and they have a big impact on the kid's life 
They make it less likely that they'll do well. That's one of our main goals. I mean, we have very good reasons for time trying to reduce teen pregnancy. And so even though it's going down, it's still way too high. And if we could get it to go lower, we'd be better off. So oh, I want to come back now to Obama's tier approach. And this I'm going to say one thing after this, but this is what I want to conclude on uh, because it shows kind of the enigma of where we are now. So HHS has this working group with Mathematica Policy Research to identify the programs that are successful. I told you about that. And then we conducted the federal grant competition to give the money to the programs that do the most good, as I've told you already, uh, and um, um, how important the role of randomized control trials are. And the Obama administration awarded 75. They divided these into tier one and tier two. Tier one is the highly successful the ones that have the very strongest evidence. Tier two is promising good evidence, but not quite as strong. And just as planned by the Obama approach, we're spending most of the money on the tier one initiatives. And the Office of Adolescent Health is doing a fabulous job of implementing the programs. And then in July 2016, the Obama administration did something that had never been done before. They released the results after five years of these programs of 41 high quality random assignment studies. 41, nothing like that. 10 years before that, I don't think we had 21 random assignment studies. So it's really, a, that in itself is a major achievement. Um, I'm gonna come back to what Trump did. So I realize this is complex. I'm, I'm kind of ashamed of this graph. I love simple graphs, but I, I want to give you accurate information. So here's, here, here is what this found. Remember back to the slide where I said that about at the most 10 to 15, 20% of programs succeed. So here is what happened with these 41 studies. First of all, only 28 of the studies met the criteria. Remember I told you that Office of Adolescent Health played a big role in making sure that the best programs uh, got the most attention. So they narrowed down the programs to the best programs and they found that there was at least one, uh, same criteria that we use in selecting the programs, uh, there was at least one significant effect uh, in 23% of the programs in tier one and 36% tier two, you expect it to be the other way around because tier two is supposed to be lower quality and tier one higher, but it didn't work out that way. But 36, whoops, but 36% right here is really an impressive number. And now, if you look at the share of just the high quality, those 28 high quality evaluations, it's 33% and 50%. 50%, that is an amazing, uh, well, let me not say amazing, let me be more balanced here. That's kind of surprising. Uh, so I think it implies that we're moving in the right direction. And if you look at these be behaviors that are directly related to sex, and especially if you look down here at these are the um, uh, contraceptive use, and then if you look at actual pregnancy, pregnancy is one out of four for tier two, a uh, tier one, and four out of eight, again, 50%. This is the ultimate, this is by far the most important measure. They're actually reducing pregnancy. So I would say that we, these 41 studies, or at least a portion of them, are quite successful. There are a lot of them, they're all over the country. They were run by normal people out in the countryside that weren't you know, specially trained and all that. And they work closely with the Office of Adolescent Health. So it's really, I think this is really quite a fine performance. So what do you think old HHS did? They got money from Congress and they granted money to 81 new programs. And they worked with the programs and encouraged them to use the most successful programs, the programs that were most likely to be successful from that first round of studies. So this is exactly, this is the strategy we should be following. And the pro, these projects are three years into, into their implementation. So they're just getting to the place where they're understanding exactly what's going on and how to produce the kind of impacts that were produced in the first round. Hopefully even more of the programs are gonna do that. But they haven't reached their big evaluations in the fifth year. And they get a letter in the mail from the Obama administration that says, sorry, you're not gonna have two and a half years funding, you're gonna have half year funding, we're cutting your funds. So this second round of 81 programs is gonna last until June and then it's gone. So I think we're in the midst of the most successful approach 
to solving a social problem that we've ever had and results that are very, very promising, and now it's gone. It wasn't justified by Congress. It was not predicted. There was no notice. It just happened. And several programs to help evaluation and implementation and so forth that were paid for by the grant ended overnight, and everybody from programs was released. So to me, that's pretty disappointing. As I told you, I'm, my spirits are lifted. Uh, because the home visiting is coming next, and I think we'll see these kind of results. I think there's, I've followed very closely and talked with a lot of people involved in evaluation, and I think we'll see these kind of, what, you know, if you're, if you're a cynic, you would say are mixed results. If you've been following this for years and been involved in it, you would say are, is promising. The overall strategy can work, and it could back up the results we got in teen pregnancy prevention, and then I think it will really be very, very encouraging. So here's a, I'm not going to read this to you, but I think ideology achieved a victory here in the Obama administration without any kind of review of evidence, without informing the programs, without engaging in any kind of discussion, and defied the Congress in the process. And so they ended the programs, and now they're using the money for absence only, which has been the Repub Republican position of the right all along. So I think it's an enormous mistake. You know, it bothers you. We shouldn't, that's a bad way for government to operate. But we're in the midst, I think, of a very promising strategy that at last we can achieve some serious victories over the social problems that the nation has that could generalize to other approaches. So it would be possible to be upset and to think that the evidence-based movement has suffered a mortal blow. No. When I originally was invited to give this talk, I was going to talk about the raging branches of the evidence-based movement. Every one of these has been developed or actually invented in the last decade. And they all have a history of their own, and only one of them has received any kind of negative blow from the administration. But it's too big, and it's occurring in too many places in the country. To, it can't be stopped. This cannot be stopped. So we are going to have a history of evidence-based policy. The main thing that we lack, I think, is a way to use federal resources more effectively. And I think that the tiered, uh, the tiered based Obama approach is the way to go. And I think we'll get back to it sooner rather than later. And we'll be able to develop it. And I think the promise of the approach will be shown next year and the following year with the release of multiple evaluations about home visiting. And with that, I'll take questions. Yes? Uh, so I think a big problem we're running into right now is polarization of both parties. Neither party really wants to work together with the other party. So instead of just like evidence-based policy is definitely on the back burner, it's hard to just find something that they agree on. So what I've been looking for are policies that I think both parties agree on fundamentally, yep. and then making sure that those are actually good Yep, policies. that is a, a, a extremely worthy goal. I left one thing out. Let me tell you this and come back before you go any further with that. I told you that the, the Obama administration didn't even consult with Congress before they ended these programs. Well, the Congress has not ruled on them yet, and the Congress controls the purse strings. And I think some of you may realize it's really 2017. The Congress gets to declare every time there's a new year. And they have not said that it's 2018 yet because we haven't passed a budget for 2018. And part of that budget is this program, the Teen Pregnancy Prevention Program. And there is every possibility that the Congress will overrule the administration. In fact, the Senate is doing that. And they're doing it on a bipartisan basis, Republicans in the Senate. Not all of them, of course, but enough so that you have a majority. And the provision in the Senate bill is not the provision in the House bill. And so this could, this whole disaster that I've been describing could be overturned. So there is agreement that the, teen, the tiered approach that the Obama administration took is a wise thing to do. And that's especially remarkable because Republicans like so little that Obama did. So I think there is some bipartisanship here. Go ahead. Uh, so two policies I found were the child tax credit and then the earned income tax credit. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on Yeah, they're highly bipartisan. 
They were founded on a bipartisan basis. Um, and one even more, to me, even more interesting, not more important, but more interesting, was the, found, was the creation of the additional child tax credit, which is, you know, 25 or a huge number of billions of dollars. And that was passed in 1997, almost completely bipartisan. There was virtually no disagreement. And, you know, we're talking about a really serious 26, 27, 28 billion dollars, a lot of money. So there are things that are bipartisan on the Hill. One problem is the media emphasizes the partisanship. And this is a case of, I, I would call it ugly partisanship, and especially sneaky partisanship on the part of the administration. Uh, but there are positive stories there. Other questions or comments? I love being in a room with people I can't even see because of the lights. You think there's any threat to my bodily damage here? Yes. Uh, the only, you said that the only major one that has been hit so far is the teen pregnancy. Only one what? You said that the only major one that has been hit so far is the teen pregnancy initiative. Out of all of these. Of the Obama? Yeah, the evidence. Okay, all of them are getting, the last two on uh, employment uh, are pretty much bit in the dust. All of the others have evaluations that are not as big. They're not major like this one. And they weren't developed as a unified strategy. But they all have evidence of success. And, I, and I, the other program that is big is home visiting, and we'll get that next year. It's very similar in many respects uh, to the teen pregnancy prevention. So two of the programs, I think we're going to get really big, important evaluations. Un uh, it, it's entirely fair to call them unprecedented. And we're going to get more information about whether we can build a set of social programs. Because think about this. We have to have thousands of these programs. It's not enough to have one or five or 10 or 20. You've got to have thousands of them, like we have schools, because we're trying to solve national problems here. So I think all four, all four of the, other than the labor ones, we have evidence that they have succeeded, but it's on a small scale. Two of them are on a small scale, and the two big ones are really, I think, going to be very encouraging. Was there another hand waving back there? So, Bill, you should throw me out. Oh, yes, go ahead. You know, understandably, there's a little bit of discouragement about um, participating in the policy process, I think, for students. So my question is, what would your recommendations be if someone wanted to support evidence-based policymaking as a private citizen, as a public administrator? What would your recommendations be for, you know, the folks in this room? Here's what I would tell them, and I do this all the time. Uh, I had years and years and years of experience where I conducted a discussion like I hope you have with your students. And they would say things to me, I never forget this, I, I can't, don't have time to go in the whole, whole circumstance, but where they would have a letter from a mother saying that their child succeeded in this program. And that shows you for sure that the program is successful. That kind of evidence was the main thing we had. Well, that day is gone. I mean, that day is, it's dead. That is a huge achievement. And then you can see from the, I think, I've, I hope that those 14 students can see, we're moving in the right direction. We're definitely, uh, this, the, 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 the uh, evidence-based policy of the Obama administration, I think, has real promise. And I didn't talk at all about that last slide. If you, have your students Google any of the things on that last slide, and they will see numerous examples of policies that are really working, and they're innovative, they're fascinating, they're just terrific policies. So I think we've got so many things going on that I don't think can be stopped now that we're going to improve not just in one thing, but in a whole series of things that will improve our public policy. So. Uh, I'm, I'm very optimistic, and, I, and they should be too, and I think they would be if they studied it even more carefully than they have so far. 
Yes. Yeah, uh, to what extent do state and local governments pick up the slack? You know what? One of the policies on, in fact, to, let me address the 14 students in responding to you. There, one of the programs is called uh, Results First. <coughs> Google Results First. It is an amazing program. First of all, it was paid for entirely by foundations. There's no public money in it. The a couple of little dinky foundations, Pew and MacArthur. And they got 26 states, 27 now I believe, and several counties, in, mostly in California, to sign up. And they work with those uh, counties and with the states to, to see that they pick a social problem, problem first. And then they see all the programs in their state that address that social problem. And then they do a literature review for whether those, there's evidence that they work. And they almost always find out none of them work. So you know what they do? They kill the programs and they use the money to invest in programs that have good benefit cost ratios. This is exactly the Obama approach. It's exactly the general approach that we should be taking to the decision about how we, which programs we use. We want to start with success and make it even better. So here's a case, 27 states are doing it. They're actually engaged in doing this. So yes, it's definitely happening. We also have a very, I don't have this on my list, I should write this down, Results for America. And they are working with the states and with the cities. I think they're working with 100 cities. They just passed 100. And they're doing a lot of activities on evidence-based policy. This stuff is growing like a cancer. Yes? Uh, I, I just wanted to um, mention the fact that, you know, we have programs that are there because of legislation, like child yeah, programs. Yeah, almost all of them. Are. And, and now we have programs that are not, you know, we can get rid of them any day, any yeah. time. And so... Evidently, you, the <laughs> king brings the prevention's one of them. <laughs> yeah, so I think we need to keep that in mind, because no matter how poorly child welfare programs may perform, we're not going to get rid of them. We can't get rid of them. Right. They're protecting children. Right, right. Even if they're not but, doing it but well. But I totally agree with that. But let me point out to you that these methods that we're developing, and especially on that last piece of paper, they can work. They can work in those programs as well. And there are many places where they're being tried. I'm, I know of several situations where child protection that you're describing is a real focus of evidence-based policy, which it never has been. It's a classic case of we're spending billions of dollars. I think we spend nine billion federal dollars and even eight billion federal dollars and even more state and local dollars. So we're spending close to 18 billion dollars on these programs, and most of them we have no idea whether they work. So we're making advances there too. I think we're, in general, we're making <coughs> there are a lot of areas where we're advancing. Yes. Yes. Uh, are there any findings with regard to? sort of aggregate programs, let's say the uh, uh, child credit or, yeah. you know, yeah. as opposed to targeted programs. Yes, what yes, we have, we have fairly good research on many of those and programs and they show impacts. Okay, and what about internationally uh, where there are uh, guaranteed income and those sorts of One of the programs on my list is called JPAL, okay. J-P-A-L. And they have done something like 900 random assignment experiments, mostly in developing countries, on issues like uh, can you, what techniques can you use to get uh, parents that live in areas that have a lot of malaria and mosquitoes to put uh, uh, netting over the beds of their infants and kids. And with great results, um, they estimated I can't remember this number, but it's several million, tens of millions of people have been affected by these programs. 900 random assignment studies for in developing nations. So read, Google JPAL, you get all kinds of stuff. There was another question. Could yes. You? Oh, hi. I'm actually one of the students in that MK program. Uh, my question to you is, uh, aside from. Um, or I guess what was being used prior to Obama's evidence initiative? So what was, what was being used to evaluate uh, programs that did work? You know what, there, there, are, there were various evaluation requirements, but our evaluation methods were so lousy that even programs that were evaluated, we didn't really learn much. 
One, I'm just going to tell you why. It's because the, the groups that were tested, the experimental and control group, were not equivalent in the beginning. And if they're not equivalent in the beginning, how do you know if you had an impact, even if there's a difference at the end? You can't attribute it to the intervention. So then, the, uh, uh, gradually, uh, researchers started using random assignment, and that's a way of making sure the groups are equivalent at the beginning. Now, if there's a difference at the end, it's because of the intervention. And that really, I know that sounds simplistic, but that really is the major reason we've been able to develop research is such a fundamental, I said several times, it's a fundamental tool of the evidence-based movement, and it works. Yeah? You mentioned earlier that a lot of programs that don't work, we tend to be funding. And before that, you even mentioned that we don't even know what we're funding now. Right, right. So how would you say that we could begin to keep general public track of the federal spending and how could we spread the popularity of the programs that are successful? Yeah, uh, any program that's successful, if we can show it to people, they'll see it and they will support it, I think. There's a great example uh, of a program like the one that you're referring to and that's Title I of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which is, I think it's $15 billion now been in existence since 1965. Multiply, you know, what's that, 50 years or whatever it is by, you know, the equivalent of 15, 16, 17 billion dollars a year. That's a lot of money. And it supports all kinds of stuff, uh, which in a way I think that's good. We give the states flexibility, but hardly any evaluation. That's changing gradually. There's more evaluation now. So I think the, the essential parts of the Obama approach uh, that we've been developing even before Obama and now are still doing despite the, uh, the death of the, or apparent death of the TPP program. So evaluating, keeping track of the evaluation, encouraging states to replicate the programs that have proved successful in evaluation. So it's a lot of the basic steps that are in this approach that I've just described to you. I think that in the long run we'll take over and we'll, it'll increase year by year by year and we'll develop successful programs and we'll spend a lot more of that $15 billion that we probably have been wasting for a long time. That fits perfectly into the ORSA category of we don't know and soon we will. Well, let me thank our speaker thank for you. covering a very complex topic and for all your time and attention here. Let me apologize. Oh, wait, wait, I forgot. Please. Thank you for coming. Really, I mean that sincerely. I really, it's always good to have an audience, you know? And you even applauded at the end, as I recall, so that's good. Well, let me apologize to the note takers in the audience. I forgot a very important point. We already have Ron's PowerPoint up on our. Brookings Mountain West website, just as we'll have the video of the lecture in a few days. So if you need to refer back to any of his points or tables or charts, you can do that as we speak. Uh, and let me put in a commercial for, actually next week will be our next lecture. We don't have them every week, so pick up a schedule on your way out or check our website or give us your email and we'll get you announcements of all this kind of stuff. But next week we have a colleague, Bill Fry, coming out from Brookings. Bill's one of the leading demographers in the nation. He studies at the national, state, and local levels who we are by age, ethnicity, race. As many of you know in this room, we are in one of the more diverse cities in America. We are at the, a public university that tied as the first most diverse public university in the nation. So it's a topic that is a, should be of interest to all of us. Bill's going to have a real in-depth dive into who we are here in Nevada as well as the nation. If you haven't seen it, I'd recommend a, a Pew Research report that came out a few weeks ago that looked at the nation and where our diversity is headed. And it looked at the year 2060 and where we will be racially, ethnically. And there was one city that mirrors where the entire nation will be in the year 2060 today. Anyone care to guess what that city is? Wow, what a smart group. Yes, Las Vegas is where the nation will be in a, in a few decades. So what better city to study and learn public policy and all that's wrapped up in that. So if you can join us next week, we'd love to see you. Thanks for coming.